Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> an unusual subject, uh, Don Giovanni and architecture. Why Don Giovanni? Because today, 234 years ago, Mozart um, uh, had, uh, uh, took place in Prague, the, uh, the first, uh, uh, you know, representation of the opera by uh, Mozart, uh, Don Giovanni, a very famous uh, work by, by this very unusual, uh, unusually gifted uh, uh, composer. So I thought of uh, attacking this subject, Don Giovanni and architecture. And uh, it seems uh, certain architects very important today are, you know, more or less uh, explicitly connected with Don Giovanni. And I will explain why. First, Frank Gehry. Frank Gehry, who did uh, uh, the, the stage design for uh, the opera Don Giovanni uh, at, uh, in, uh, in Los Angeles, and uh, I will read a few things about this, and then uh, I'll show images, and then I'll show images of the building where the, this opera uh, was performed uh, in Los Angeles, also built by Frank Gehry. The, you probably know it, um, the Walt Disney uh, Concert Hall in Los Angeles. So let's read. <clears throat> Three of the greatest operas ever written were collaborations between librettist Lorenzo da, da Ponte and composer Wolf, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, The Marriage of Figaro, Don Giovanni, and Cosi Fan Tutte. Over the next three years, the Los Angeles Philharmonic will present the trilogy, one opera each season, each conducted by Gustavo Dudamel. Set designs were, were, will be created by three of the most influential. Well, this is uh, you know the future tense, but the, the text is, I think is from 2012. <clears throat> so what I'm reading, uh, I mean the event took already place. Set designs will be would be were created. Let me change let me correct the text. Uh, were created by three of the most influential architects of our time. And each architect worked with leading fashion designers <clears throat> to create a unique and distinctive visual setting for each of these timeless masterpieces. Each complete opera performance was, was, uh, it took place at uh, Walt Disney Concert Hall. So uh, this, this is an image with a stage design by Frank Gehry. What he took, actually, I, I will read. I have uh, another piece of text uh, written by him. Essentially, he did this um, stage design with uh, huge uh, paper rolls. And, uh, you know, I, I like this kind of stage design because it's, it's uh, you know, it doesn't cost a lot, uh, really. It's uh, sustainable and it's interesting visually. And it connects, of course, with his interest in, uh, you know, uh, fragmentation and so on. So using 80 rolls of paper, architect Frank Gehry transformed a venue ill-suited for uh, theatrical performances with a strikingly simple yet effective stage design. The Los Angeles Philharmonic's Don Giovanni showed earlier in that year at the city's Walt Disney's concert hall, which Gary himself realized in 2003. For the Giovanni project, one of the biggest challenges was that posed by the space itself. The hall was built as a symphonic venue, meaning it, doesn't, it didn't have the elements of a typical theater stage, no curtain, orchestra pit, wings, or fly loft. A rigging system. And Gary and co-designer sisters Kate and Laura Molloy of uh, Molloy of fashion label Rodarte, I never heard of it, but I guess it's a famous one, needed to ensure the theatrical performance could flow seamlessly in such a space. Inspired by the pages of Giovanni's sex book, they designed a slew of king-sized white pages that, took, uh, that look as though a giant crumpled and dropped them on stage. 
forming a marble backdrop to actors, the forms made of 2.7 meters wide paper rolls also separate actors from the orchestra, <clears throat> which sits on a plane elevated about one meter at the back of the stage. The architect comes a designer trend will continue, well, continued at the Los Angeles Philharmonic uh, <clears throat> the next year uh, with Jean Nouvel, when Jean Nouvel designed the marriage of Figaro and then Zaha Hadid was scheduled to do the Cosi Fan Tute in 2000, 2014. I actually am emotional now because I see greatness here. I see important architects, you know, collaborating with other fields, with uh, musicians, with orchestras, with, uh, you know, great masterpieces by, uh, uh, by Mozart. And I, I really think we need something like this here in this in our country as well. It's enough with the architect just being the slave of some, some banal jobs and not asserting the architects culturally in a wide way as these people did and do. And, and, and that's why I chose to talk about this because we must change something here in this country. We cannot continue to, to minimize the, 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 the role of the architect in society. So yeah, of course it is, it is, uh, it is uh, uh, you know, uh, provocative and, and uh, inspiring to see that a man who was, he was close to 90, well, no, maybe not, uh, well, over 80, Frank Gehry, when he designed this, when most people are, are actually retired and if they are alive, they watch TV in apathy, this man was still creating and uh, besides the many buildings he was, he was uh, working on. And let's read <clears throat> this is well, who wrote this? This is an inspiring opportunity to work with my friends. This is what Frank Gehry said, with my friends at the Los Angeles Philharmonic. This is a project very close to Gustavo Dudamel's heart. He knows the music like the back of his hand and has a unique vision that I find very exciting, says Gary. Kate and Laura's work reminds me of my early days. It is free and fearless and not precious. Let's read again. It is free and fearless and not precious. And I think our work should also be free and fearless and not precious. Gary envisions a set that he describes as a moving still life on stage that works in concert with the costumes and supports the music of Don Giovanni. Gary's modifications will take place where took place, um, took place the orchestra upstage on raised leaves, approximately three and a half feet above the action taking place downstage. The choir benches will, would be removed to allow space for the orchestra. This layout aim to create a unified ensemble between the orchestra and soloists. You know, the, the problem was that this space was not designed for, for this kind of performance. So he had to, to change things around. Although he was this one, the, the one who designed the building and I am going to show the building in a few minutes. With a focus on the action at the front of the stage, creating intimacy between the soloists and the audience. This configuration had recently been tested in a rehearsal with Gustavo Dudamel and Yasuhisa Toyota, the chief acoustician who collaborated with Gary and the Los Angeles Philharmonic to develop Walt Disney Concerts Hall visual and acoustic designs. So here you have a, a group of brilliant people, you know, a conductor, uh, an acu acoustician from Japan, uh, you know, Gary from the United States. And this is really what art is about. It's about bringing people together with energy, with inspiration, with exuberance, and, and giving meaning actually to, to their lives and to the lives of other people. And so here it is. Um, and uh, again, uh, this uh, opera took place in the building designed by, designed by Frank Gehry. Here he is with, uh, I guess, the, maybe that's the Japanese um, acoustician, or I don't know who he is. Anyway, look at Gary, a man of 80, over 80, yes, and now he's over 90 and still producing things 
that are uh, you know disturbing some and uh, you know uh, bringing joy to others uh, this is a sketch he did for the you know for the for the stage design and uh, here they are the actors the audience well before the pandemic there was no fear of uh, you know being in close proximity and the, and the orchestra behind and this is what art is I, I i kept saying and i keep saying that the old the oldest definition of art that i found uh, is from uh, the proto indo european language and it is art equals bridge equals god so art is about bringing pe people together and this is what we look at right right now uh, in this picture Art brings people together, not just in space, but also in time, because here it was about an opera composed, you know, 250 years ago, almost by Mozart. And I think it's beautiful because it was said that that art transgresses death or could transgress death. And, and, and it is true. It is true. It is maybe the only medium which has this power. Okay, it's it's a very vulnerable medium. It is maybe uh, in part an illusion, but but we need such illusions. And what would life be without them? So let's look at the building where this opera uh, was performed, the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles by Frank Gehry. You probably know it. Uh, I mean, you know, he he built uh, a number of buildings, kind of similar. But imagine that Don Giovanni was performed in this building uh, in that year. I think it was 2012, if I'm not mistaken. And after this is where it was performed. Uh, you know, the the the, the next two uh, operas by by uh, Mozart uh, with the designs by Jean Nouvel and Zaha Hadid. And you wonder, you know, how come these people who built so much and built so much, Jean Nouvel is alive, Frank Gehry is alive, uh, even Zaha Hadid is alive. I mean, yes, she died, but, but, but her influence and her office continue. How come they had so-called had time to even do stage design, you know, for such an important uh, opera and, uh, you know, uh, played, performed uh, in a, you know, a large city and so on. Well, it's about passion. When you have passion, of course you find time, you know, because it's, it's creativity, it's pleasure. It's actually pleasure. Anyway, uh, so Los Angeles and uh, the building, the typical uh, Frank, Frank Gehry architecture, which some people criticize. But I still, I, I still think he has to be admired for bringing something new to architecture. But this newness is actually derived, as he himself said, from Bernini, from the great Roman uh, Baroque uh, architect and artist. He received a lot of impetus and inspiration from the great um, uh, Bernini. A great uh, one of the great Baroque uh, forces in art. Himself, uh, um, you know, uh, handling uh, several balls, so to speak, because he did sculpture. He was mainly a sculptor. He also did architecture and uh, painting and drawing and all the rest. So Frank Gehry, who held and has a good relationship with artists, and uh, it shows, it, it shows in his buildings. Now, we cannot imagine that you can do such a building working with a T-square and a rectangle. It's not possible. It is simply not possible. This man, Frank Gehry, has at his disposal a large factory in a way, you know, very well equipped like NASA. And that's how they are able to do this. I visited uh, Fondation uh, Louis, Louis Vuitton uh, in Paris with some students from Bucharest. And I have to tell you, I didn't go with great expectations. I didn't like the building so much from where I saw it in magazines or on the web. But when I arrived there, especially at the top of the building, I couldn't believe my eyes. I was shocked in the good sense of the word. The structure is absolutely amazing. Amazing. I mean, we cannot even draw it. 
what he built, we can't even draw. We can't even imagine. So there, you know, those who throw stones of Rangeri should think twice and should visit his buildings. Buildings which are actually adventures. Well, you know, certain things could be perhaps criticized, but then you can criticize anything. But th this man was, was uh, pushing the limits of, of architecture in his own way. You know, other people do it in a different way. But I think there is room in this world for everybody. The idea is not to, not to succumb to apathy, to indifference, to non-activity, and to lack of creativity. That's, that's the idea. How you express your creativity, this is really up to you. And of course, the context matters. But we create the context. We, we cannot accuse the context continuously that it is the cause of our uh, inactivity. No, uh, we have to change it if, if it's not uh, auspicious. You know, I mean, this is one of the many buildings that Frank Gehry designed. And, uh, you know, there are creative things here going on. You know, I, I, I mean, just try to imagine. I actually saw the retrospective of uh, his work some good years ago in, in New York at the Guggenheim Museum, and I was able to enter a model. Yes. The model was so big that there was a chair, actually. It was a concert hall. I, I don't know if it wasn't exactly this one. I don't know. I don't remember. But I sat on a chair inside the model. Now, unfortunately, to have the models come to New York City from Los Angeles, I read in a newspaper, it was immensely expensive. Eight million dollars were spent just to organize this exhibition. And of course, to me, this is not very sustainable, but, you know, uh, art culture sometimes uh, require, uh, uh, you know, financial efforts. And if they afforded it, what can we say? Personally, I would not have done it, but uh, nobody asked me what, what my opinion is about this. Anyway, I, I appreciate the fact that, you know, things are happening. In, in the world. And uh, they are happening to the extent they are fueled by exuberance, by, by creativity. And we need creativity. Otherwise, we, we die in, in irrelevance and uh, we die in boredom. And uh, a life spent in boredom is an unlived life. Anyway, so, so the drawings, the drawings of the building, you saw the building. Uh, Don Giovanni was performed inside this uh, drone uh, project. In, in a way, it is very beautiful. I mean, just think of it. You know, Mozart, of course, didn't know that 200, uh, let's say, 50 years later, his opera would be performed in Los Angeles. Well, at that time, uh, Los Angeles didn't exist. Uh, you know, I mean, it is beautiful. You know, 250 years later, Opera Don Giovanni was to be performed in a city which at the time when Mozart, um, you know, composed it, didn't even exist. And anyway, he didn't know, of course, about Frank Gehry, and he didn't know about Jean Nouvel, and he didn't know about Zaha Hadid. Well, with Zaha probably already he met, and uh, they probably became good friends. You see, we imagine that, uh, you know, the masters of the past were superior to the masters of the present. But I think, I think uh, across space and time, there is a, a, a oneness in a way, you know, and, uh, you know, in, in my imagination and maybe my dreaming, I like to think that, uh, you know, maybe at this very moment, Mozart is having a chat with Zaha Hadid, wherever they are, and maybe drink a coffee and maybe Mozart will smoke a cigarette. And uh, they will say, do, do, you, do you see Zaha what's happening in Bucharest? They are talking about us at this very moment. And they are showing the plan of the building of our friend, Frank, uh, you know, and that's where they perform my opera, Zaha. And you will be the next stage designer for for, uh, for the other opera, Cosi uh, Fuantute, something like this. Anyway, let's enjoy, uh, let's enjoy art because without it, you know what, 
what 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 kind of life we have. Anyway, it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful. Mozart, Frank Gehry, Zaha, uh, Jean Nouvel, and so on. And uh, yeah, you know, the, the, the malicious ones could very well, uh, you know, uh, contest certain things and throw stones and uh, criticize, but, but things are moving, you know, they are moving because of such people who are restless and who create continuously. And, uh, you know, it, it's really uh, beyond, I mean, I don't think what's, what matters here is the, the personal taste because I could like this building and someone else could not like it. But I think, by, but I think we, we all can admire, you know, a tenacious desire to give meaning to life through creativity and to, 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 to create new, a new cosmos of hope in a way. You know, th this kind of building could not have been built uh, you know, even uh, 20 or 30 years ago, it was built, uh, you know, now. Now we arrive at another, I would say, a provocative building, much smaller, designed by Kopp Himmelblau, uh, Wolf Prix uh, in particular. He is the founder of this office. He had a partner and then he, now he has another partner, but he is the main force there. A mini opera space in München. And why do I show this work here? Because it is connected with Don Giovanni. And I will explain a little bit later. Uh, this text I took from, from, from the office itself, I mean, from, from their website. And there was this title, Soundscaping. This is a sketch made by uh, Volprix. And then we read, <clears throat> the task which we had to solve with our design was to create a space with 300 seats or 700 people standing, standing spectators for experimental performances of the Bavarian State Opera. The pavilion should be dismountable, transportable, and remountable and make the respective urban space distinctive through its shape. Mass and therefore weight are the decisive criteria for good acoustics. The conception of the Pavilion 21 mini opera space therefore had to overcome a contradiction to design a lightweight construction, which must allow to, to be this and reassembled quickly, but which at the same time meets the acoustical requirements of a concert hall. Hence, how do we create the conditions for good acoustics despite a reduction of mass. Already the first considerations fixed in drawings show the basic concept of the pavilion to introduce elements which are on, on the one hand, the spatial transformation of sound sequences and which on the other hand, develop sound reflecting and absorbing properties through the pyramid-like shape, soundscaping. The idea to combine architecture with music is not new. Also, the term soundscaping is not new. Similar to landscaping, it involves gestalt. Soundscaping originates in the 1940s and designates a method of composing. In architecture, Le Corbusier and Yanis Xenakis, I repeat, born in Breila, together engage in the topic of music and architecture when they thought about three-dimensional implementation of musical compositions. Le Corbusier's Philips Pavilion and the partitions, partition of the windows in La Tourette. I will show at the end of this presentation the Philips Pavilion by Le Corbusier. As a starting point towards the abstraction of music into spatial form, a sequence from the song Purple Haze by Jimi Hendrix and the passage from Don Giovanni by Mozart were transcribed. Through the, the analysis of frequency sections from these pieces of music and through the combination with the computer generated 3D model, the sequences are translated into pyramidal spike constructions by means of parametric scripting. And this is the building. Again, 
you know, if we, we have two choices really in, 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 in architecture and not just in architecture, in life itself, <clears throat> to follow the, the already traced and, uh, you know, used uh, old paths or to create a new path. This is a new building. It's a building which is provocative, which is engaging, which is uh, uh, indeed, uh, maybe its uh, undeclared purpose was to epate la bourgeoisie. But uh, strangely, maybe uh, most of the, of the clients of the building or the, those who use it are exactly part of that, uh, you know, segment of society, which we call uh, the bourgeoisie. Uh, I like this building and uh, I will show a diagram where uh, you will see how Don Giovanni became uh, a tool in the hands of the architects to, to create the building. Now, yes, maybe, well, it, it is written, it was written that uh, these spikes that attack the street where, where these pyramids were, were made in order to deflect the noise of the cars. So there would be silence. I mean, there would be the adequate, uh, you know, uh, sound uh, uh, conditions within the, the opera uh, the pavilion. But I think this is maybe only part of the, the, the explanation. Uh, I, I think these uh, spikes, these pyramids that attack uh, out, outwardly, they might also represent, uh, you know, uh, a certain disposition from the side of the architects uh, towards um, provocative gestures. Uh, and, and, and here it is, you see, Don Giovanni, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, they recorded uh, the frequencies uh, uh, emanated by the music and uh, in, in some uh, they created a sonogram and through scripting and programming somehow they arrived from here and uh, as I read uh, there were two sources two, sor two musical sources one was from Jimi Hendrix and one from Mozart and combining them you know somehow you know they arrived at uh, you know, the musicality of this, uh, you know, uh, uh, architectonic configuration or geometric configuration, which became the building. Well, you know, this is kind of the explanation in what way John, Don Giovanni insinuated itself into the making of the building. Uh, you see at the top, Jimi Hendrix Purple Haze, they recorded the frequencies of his music, then the frequencies of Mozart's music. And uh, <laughs> well, I don't know if, if the linear connection is so uh, uh, smooth, you know, maybe, so, I, I mean, I don't know, but one thing is for sure, the building that they arrived at is interesting and is uh, engaging. And indeed you see a relationship between uh, music and architecture. We all know that architecture was called frozen music. Um, well, you know, those are the words, but from, from this uh, statement to arrive at a, at a building that functions and is, uh, is interesting, uh, there is a little bit of a distance. Anyway, it was built. And not only that it was built, but it is easily demountable and it can be uh, rebuilt apparently quickly in some other place. It is clear to me that art, when it is significant, brings something new. If it doesn't bring something new, it will be forgotten. So we have to choose in our lives. Do we do, you, do, we do things without any relevance for the future or we do things with some relevance I know we are confronted now with all kinds of things, the climate change, you know, sustainability, the rising levels of the seas, the melting of the icebergs, things are not simple. But I think even with very modest means, we could assert an art and an architecture that are alive and which do not repeat things of, you know, uh, that are already done. Yes, this is a provocative building, 
And, uh, you know, it's almost amazing that it was built and that it was uh, accepted by the, those who commissioned it. But you see, it is possible. It is possible to do e exceptional things if you believe in what you are doing and you have the, the tools to, to, you know, uh, make it possible. In a way, what we look at here is a building which proclaims the, the freedom of art, as it is written on the facade of the, of the, of the secessionist building in Vienna, to each time its art and to art its freedom. And this must be understood everywhere in this world, and not now, every time, to, to each time it, it's art. So you cannot make an art today or an architecture today, you know, uh, uh, repeating something that was made, uh, I don't know, 150 years ago. You have to create an art and an architecture for your time. So to each time it's art and to art it's freedom. Without freedom, art cannot be. This must be understood. Anyway. It's an interesting building. I like it and uh, it works. And apparently the acoustics are excellent. And look at the building or look at that big tree or those big trees there, you know, you have nature and culture. Uh, maybe the culture is a little bit aggressive, but um, it's, it's really the, 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 the um, the emotion of the artist, the emotion of the, sometimes, I mean, not sometimes, often the artist is uh, struggling. So there is this aspect to art, the struggle. And the building in a way expresses this, you know, it's, it's a building that, that uh, engages, engages the street and uh, maybe it even screams a little bit to the, to the street. It is as if the art, wants to get out of its skin somehow and, and, and extend itself in, 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 in its conflict with uh, passing cars or maybe with apathetic uh, uh, passersby or whatever. Inside, yes, we have bars, we have uh, Jean de Vivre, we have, you know, it's Milchen, you know, a rich uh, city with, uh, with a high level of life. And, uh, but, 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 you know, the, that high level of, of, of life uh, cannot, cannot say no to art. They need art. The bankers need art. And uh, you see here in the lower corner, the, the ideogram or the graphic symbol of the pavilion uh, is right here. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of nice. You know, you see it here as a bi-dimensional little vignette and then you look at the building which was built and it was built coherently uh, with courage, with knowledge, with uh, high technology, with inspiration coming from Jimi Hendrix and, uh, and Mozart. And here you see, I don't know, it's either the dismantling of the building or vice versa, the building of it, but whatever, it, it works and it was meant to be, to be uh, easily demountable and, and uh, rebuilt. Now I end this presentation on, uh, on Don Giovanni and architecture because I, I, I read the text uh, from uh, Kopp Himmelblau's website about the Philips Pavilion in Brussels in 1959 when Le Corbusier collaborated with Yanis Xenakis. Yanis Xenakis um, had his parents Greek, but he was born in Romania in, in uh, Braila and he left Braila when he was nine years old. Then he went to Athens and there he studied engineering. Actually, he didn't study architecture, but then uh, after the war, he, he, he went to Paris, was engaged by, was, uh, was employed by Le Corbusier. And uh, they did this remarkable, remarkable work. In my opinion, one of the best buildings of the 20th century, unfortunately it was destroyed. Uh, and many think that actually Yanis Xenakis was the true author of the building because Yanis Xenakis had this interest 
and in marrying music and architecture. And Yanis Xenakis, besides being a, a gifted architect, although he never studied architecture, he studied engineering and mathematics, I think, uh, was also one of the most important uh, composers of uh, avant-garde music of the second half of the 20th century. But let's look at the building. First, you know, uh, you see on the right, uh, just like we saw those, um, uh, you know, recorded frequencies from uh, Mozart and, uh, and Jimi Hendrix in the work of Kopp Himmelblau, here we see these are these were done by Yannick Xenakis. These were not done by Le Corbusier. This is the building, and uh, in my opinion, was a, was a, was a, an astonishing building. Look at this. Now, why was this destroyed? You know, I, this infuriates me. You know, it, it's true. Most of the time, buildings built for um, you know uh, world exhibitions or whatever are destroyed and it's very sad and we talk about sustainability well if you build such a building how could you destroy it well it was destroyed and uh, and uh, it's it's a great loss this building was done um, uh, with the collaboration of three people le corbusier yanis xenakis and varese uh, uh, a french composer so you had actually a musician, an architect, and the musician architect, that is Yanis Xenakis. And inside, you can see on uh, YouTube, you can see the, the, the projection, the video, with the film that was created specifically to be uh, uh, projected inside this pavilion. And here, here you have, uh, 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 you know, when I look at this picture, I, I, I smile. You have Le Corbusier, of course, on the left, and Yanis Xenakis on the right. But what is strange about this picture, and maybe you do not know, Le Corbusier lost the sight on, in his right eye when he was 28, and uh, Yanis Xenakis also had only one functioning eye something happened to him in the in the second world war so now we have here two people two architects but together they only had two eyes uh functioning eyes they are you know waiting for the train to bring them back to paris i guess from from uh, brussels anyway back to the brilliant building and it is a brilliant building and you know it's impossible to remain without emotions when you see so much creativity. It's impossible. This is a, you know, a kind of a collage. Somebody did this, you know, was done after, um, you know, was not done by Yanis Xenakis or the office of the Corbusier. But I think it's a, it's a nice uh, collage of images. Uh, it, it is a famous building. And in my opinion, is one of the best buildings that came out of uh, Le Corbusier's uh, office, and uh, different from most his other works. Now, if Yanis Xenakis was indeed the main author of this building, we do not quite know, although the experts seem to be inclined to think so. But I also know that Yanis Xenakis built a few buildings without Le Corbusier on his own, and they are not as brilliant as those built together with Le Corbusier. So it's, I would say that uh, the proximity of Le Corbusier, um, uh, you know, helped arrive at a higher level of excellence. But nevertheless, Yanis Xenakis was a, a, an admirable creator, and I will end this presentation actually with a building he built by himself without Le Corbusier, which kind of contradicts what, what I just said for an exhibition in front of Centre Georges Pompidou. Look at the plan. It's magnificent. It's free. It's, 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 it's uh, you know, unpredictable and, and uh, immeasurable in a way, although, although we had an engineer here who told us that actually the, the structural system uh, is very logical and it's, 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 it's uh, you know, uh, it has a coherence, uh, but but the plan itself, if we look at the plan, is it, very free. 
we look at the model uh, and yes, again and again, it, it proclaims freedom. Uh, look at the sketches. These were done, these were done by, uh, uh, by Yanis Xenakis. And you have mathematics, you have music, and you have architecture. And this is a contemporary rendering, uh, you know, a digital rendering of, of this brilliant building. Uh, very, very sad that this building was destroyed. I, I, I mean, anyway, maybe one day will be rebuilt, maybe, because it can be rebuilt. But you see, it's, it's, uh, it's 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 a system which is non anti system and it's it's uh, it uses geometry it uses mathematics but the final result um, goes beyond uh, beyond the measurable beyond uh, beyond uh, the, you know the predictability of numbers or or, or or arithmetics or mathematics here it is uh, during the construction uh, I mean, you, you see the church, the old church here, and then you see this building, and this was done in the 50s. You know, if this building would have built now, this year, we would have said, wow, but it was built 70 years ago, almost. And uh, I end this uh, presentation with an, another work by Yanis Xenakis. In this case, he worked alone, the polytope or the diatope. Uh, in front of Centre Georges Pompidou, where there was a retrospective of his work. Yes, of the man born in Braila. This is the building. So you can tell that actually there is a relationship between this building and the building that we just saw. And this was done by the composer of avant-garde music, Yanis Xenakis. So you see here, Le Diatop, devant le Centre Georges Pompidou, sources, the archives, Xenakis at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Here we see the, the Centre Georges Pompidou. And actually, this creates the bridge between this presentation and the next one on Niki, uh, the, the great uh, French artist who uh, has a beautiful uh, sculptural work right next to Centre Georges Pompidou, Niki de, de saint Paul. So this is the building by, uh, or the structure, the pavilion, the building, yes, by uh, Yanis Xenakis, born in Braila, born and raised in Braila by, uh, until uh, nine. But I have to tell you, uh, Braila is a city where the, uh, the, I don't know how to say, with, with many geniuses, if you search on Wikipedia, you won't believe it, for a small city to have such a large number of remarkable people born there. It is something worse there. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. Anyway, on the back, the building by Renzo Piano and Sir Richard Rogers and the great engineer Peter Rice, Centre Georges Pompidou, and in the front, uh, the pavilion built by uh, Yanis Xenakis. This one was also destroyed. And again, and again, it is hard for me to believe it. And you see here, you know, the tumultuousness of the musical spirit, but which is also based on mathematics. And, and the mathematics allowed for the measurements and allowed for the building to, to come into being. You see, Centre Georges Pompidou, geste de lumière et de son, gesture of light, and sound, the diatop, Xenakis. And here, well, you don't, we don't see too much of it, but uh, many people, this was, I think, in 19, 1978. Of course, on the left, the, you don't see it in this picture, is the, the, muse, the museum for Constantin Brunkush. And uh, this is the diatop by uh, Yanis Xenakis. And here we see a view from the top. Uh, the museum by uh, Brun uh, of Port Brancusi apparently was not yet built, or something is going on here. Maybe it was during the construction. But you see here the pavilion by uh, Yanis Xenakis, and of course uh, Centre Georges Pompidou. And 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 uh, the next presentation will show a magnificent sc a sculptural installation by Niki de Saint Paul 
right here in this space. In fact, you are going to see some pictures where you see her sculptures and fragments of a part of the uh, this corner of the uh, Centre Georges Pompidou. And this this was an ease, I would say. You know, he died, but he didn't die. Uh, Yanis Xenakis. <clears throat> Uh, you don't see here in the shadows, uh, so as I said, uh, he, he was disfigured by the war uh, and he lost uh, his sight in one of the eyes. Here again, you know, it's the same thing. It's, uh, but you see, this was his room, you know, you see notations, mathematical notations, and it moves me. He was a, a brilliant musician. And I would say a brilliant architect who studied engineering and mathematics and uh, arrived in Paris and worked for Le Corbusier. And he did, so he had an important role. There is a picture in the office of Le Corbusier on Rue de Sevres, where in front of everybody there are, I don't know, 10, 15 people there. On the right is Le Corbusier and on the left is Yanis Xenakis. So he had an important role in the office of Le Corbusier. <clears throat> and Le Corbusier hired him without asking him, you know, did you study architecture? Show me your diploma. Tell me what grade you receive for your diploma. Nothing of that sort. But, but the man, uh, you know, uh, received, uh, uh, you know, the, the acceptance to work there based on his merits, intellectual and artistic. So, you know, we see here, you know, uh, images of cosmos, of planets or whatever. Well, the musician had the cosmic aspirations and I truly encourage you to listen to his music on YouTube. It's a very moving uh, uh, music done with the uh, with, uh, with means of, uh, of, of the present, meaning, uh, you know, uh, computers, technology, but the music is about emotions and uh, the hands of the creator should be, uh, should be looked at because uh, without them, the, the, the creator, the artist, the architect would be reduced to much less, if not nothing. <clears throat>